Oh, right. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being patient with the certificate stuff. Um, let's get started. If you joined this course for the first time today, I will just repeat who I am. My name is Anna Marasovic. You can refer to me by my first last name or just call me professor. I think that's easiest. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I finally set the office hours to be on Wednesdays at noon in LCR in MEP. Uh, but if that doesn't work for you, just let me know and we can, and if you need to talk to me, we can, you know, have a meeting in a different time. Um, tomorrow, I uh, will have this exceptional um, Zoom office hours um, because today just didn't work out. And my, my idea here is that um, I join and then we can go maybe over that part of the assignment uh, that was released uh, that is all about CHPC and engineering fundamentals. I think it might be useful if you know you try it with me and then if you run into errors, I can maybe help you out with um, you know um, kind of fixing those errors. Uh, some of you already reached out that you have trouble with reaching the SOC uh, GPU and P partition on CHPC. I reach out to CHPC folks and hopefully we will fix that uh, really soon. I think reach out. Um, I will, maybe we can go uh, to this slide then since I started to talk about this. Um, okay, this is old news. <laughs> Let me delete it. Is there, are there any questions about the um, first assignment or anything related to submitting assignments? Um, yeah. Yeah, about the first assignment. Uh, so we're basically just following the, the collab notebook thing that already is there. Yeah. So are we, are we training um, like the entire model or are we just training the pooling and the classification layer? You're training the entire model, okay. yeah. So you are following the call-up notebook, but you need to do two things. You need to change the model checkpoint name from whatever is there to the Berta, and you need to change the data set. You have a bunch of glue tasks there. Glue tasks are just a benchmark that compiles different tasks. You need to use only IMDB, and you need to change the whatever is the evaluation metric to be accuracy. So you just need to find kind of read the notebook and understand it in a way that you can change those parameters and put it all into a single uh, Python file that you can then, when you run as batch and your uh, bash file, there you are going to call Python and the name of your file that will then kick off training and evaluation. So you need to do these two things. It's not just about going through the column. Also, um, just so I'm sure, since there are two classes that we're predicting, it's mm -hmm. either like positive sentiment or negative sentiment. That's right. Does that mean it outputs two logits? Mm -hmm. for yeah, okay. that's right. And you will have two logits, and then you will take the max one to be the predicted label. And um, it then goes into cross entropy loss, but Hugging face offers a level of abstraction where you do not need to define the loss yourself. So if you follow the collab, you will see that there are two classes that are defined in there. One is training arguments, the, uh, the other one is trainer. And you just call trainer.train and it will do this for you. So hugging face is nice because it offers all these abstractions where you don't need to deal with a lot of stuff. Maybe you have noticed that there is a class auto, some auto model for classification, for example, it kind of handles um, what exactly will be done for you. You just give uh, the, uh, the name of the model. Yeah. So yeah, give this a try, go over this, try to train it. And then once the deadline passes, we can go over this together to maybe go into these bits and pieces of what this actually means if you did not figure it out from the notebook. You don't need to understand all the details of Hugging Face yet. Just you know, feel comfortable uh, running this, uh, this code that you have been given in the notebook for a new task and model. And with time, things are going to become clearer and clearer. Also, it's not the goal of this course to understand all the bits and pieces of training models and um, using Hugging Face. You just need to have basic level of training a model such that we can go about 
applying these explainability techniques um, uh, to that model you have trained. Other alternative is that we just talk about it and you never tried it, but then um, I don't think that would be really good for you. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Um, as a site for a CHD free account, Mm -hmm. So I think usually they are super fast, but I think because there was this, um, the whole, um, I don't want to use a curse word, problem with the data center downtown yesterday because of the humidity, everything fell apart last night. So I think they are trying to fix whatever has happened uh, last night. So I think they are slower today than uh, usually they are. I don't think so. There is plenty of time to, to run this. Yeah, going through the collab shouldn't take you more than a couple of hours and putting it in the file. So it's enough. Yeah. Uh, I've been training over the entire data set of companies. I'm thinking you did like 25,000. Yeah, there are. I So yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't I tell you think, which. Yeah, I think I don't nine to ten mm -hmm. okay i managed to kind of optimize it to train in an hour mm -hmm. but that's me so maybe i should give you some hyperparameters that will make things a little bit faster um okay that's a good note i can there are two options here either i share hyperparameters such as the things are faster or we downsample the training and evaluation size mm -hmm. So maybe downsampling the training and evaluation will be fine. Spoiler, you will see that already in a few steps, it achieves pretty good accuracy, right? Because it's pre-trained. Um, so we don't need all of that data. Okay, so I think I will just write to downsample the, the training and evaluation set. So I will revisit the instructions later. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, I have also heard that currently there are a lot of jobs queued in um, CHPC, and that's the reality of using clusters with GPUs. Anywhere you go, there will always be lots of jobs in the queue. And that's what I meant when I guess, you know, last time when I said, you know, you can't do these things in the last moment. Um, that said, if you, you know, um, run your job and you never get to a queue, that's an obvious issue. And you should just let me know, keep me updated about all of these situations that you might be, uh, you know, running into. Um, I'm happy to accommodate if you simply cannot get your job into, into the queue. Um, but that information needs to reach out to me way earlier than, you know, Thursday at 8 p.m., you realize, oh, I cannot get into the queue. That's that's the way. So have this in mind that these are no ordinary deadlines that we are dealing with in this class. Yeah. Okay, but keep me updated. I will I will really accommodate whatever you need if I deem it reasonable. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, okay, last time we stopped with the syllabus. Um, I just want to again say that you should read it very carefully. I don't want to go through the all the information there. Um, in case you have read it and have any questions, now is a good time to ask. Okay, I am assuming you read this and you know what's what's in there. Okay, so today uh, we are moving on with. Um, learning a little bit, if you don't know already, about uh, pre-trained language and vision models. And the idea here is to just quickly go over these things to understand what is the object we are going to then go about training uh, to explain itself or you know, use another technique to see how it uh, made a prediction. Um, so we are going to talk about very low level things such as how to prepare inputs for a transformer architecture, which is the, you know, the architecture we use uh, to develop these models. What is a transformer, uh, how to pre-train it and fine tune it for a text classification task and how to do so for some vision task. <laughs> okay, some of you might be, you know, you might know some of these things. So. Uh, yeah, this lecture might not be the most exciting for you, but I think we all need to be at least at a similar uh, level of uh, understanding these things. So yeah, just just a heads up, especially if you are 
uh, already working in uh, NLP. It might be a little bit dry today. All right, so um, first thing, how do we prepare inputs? This is a high level uh, illustration of uh, what goes, uh, what happens with the uh, input once we have, um, you know, given it to the transformer. We are going to do something called tokenization. Then uh, we are going to add some special tokens and transform those into some kind of integers. And I want to actually go over this a little bit slower uh, because if you haven't seen this before, it can be a little bit confusing. So uh, let's say we are going to do sentiment classification task. And uh, that's the task you have in your first assignment. Um, so sentiment classification, it's a task where you are given a, a review, like a movie review or a restaurant review, laptop review, what, whatever kind of review uh, you can imagine. In the homework, you have the IMDb data set, so you have movie reviews from IMDb uh, website. And you get this uh, review and the goal is to predict whether this review is positive or negative. Sometimes we have more than just positive or negative, but most uh, prominent version of this task is a binary classification. So we have only two classes. And um, let's say we have a review, which is only a single sentence. I actually went and checked reviews for Barbie to find one. Uh, and we got, it is funny bright and uplifting. Okay, so now um, I kind of assuming you have machine learning basics and I am assuming that your head goes into something like, okay, I have this input and I would like to represent it with a vector. And let's imagine for a moment we can do that. Uh, we represent S with the vector um, representation. So we have some kind of high dimensional vector of size D that represents this, um, that represents this sentence. And let's for a moment forget what uh, vector of this sentence could be. Uh, now just thinking about machine learning one-on-one, the, if we would like to now predict the label, we know that we need to multiply this, uh, one time D dimensional vector with a matrix of a size d times two to get the vector of two dimensions, right? So we have a matrix here. It has d rows and two columns such that vector one times d multiply with the d times two matrix will give us one time two vector, which will be useful for predicting the class. It will be useful to predict a class. We have two classes, that's why this is two, it's not an arbitrary number, uh, because then we can take whatever is max here. Let's imagine the maximum of these two values was in the first dimension. And then we can say, okay, we found max in the first dimension of this two dimensional vector. Therefore, we say that the uh, predicted label IP is one, which is here our, um, positive label, right? So that's how we go about um, classifying uh, this sentence with the one of obvious bottleneck, and that's figuring out how to represent our full sentence, right? And if we had finite number of sentences in let's say English language, then we could maybe learn a vector, a fixed vector for each one of them. Uh, but that's not possible because there is not a finite number of sentences in English language. So what will be easier for us to do is say, well, let's fix some units. Uh, we will have less of them. For example, let's let's use words. And then rep let's represent each one of these sentences with the words that compose it. And then we can use some kind of functions of vectors of those uh, words. So we will have a fixed set of words I will go back to the previous word I used, which is units, because they don't need necessarily need to be words. So for example, they could be words. Then we will have for every unit, some kind of fixed vector of that unit. 
And then what we can do is calculate the function of um, a list of vectors that represent units that uh, are occurring in our sentence. Let's say we chose units to be words, then we have it is funny comma, bright comma, and uplifting uh, period. These are our words. Okay, so I, I made this illustration to show you that uh, the reason why we will have a set of units and why we are going to first work with representation of those units and combine them in some very eloquent way to get one vector that will represent our full uh, sentence. Uh, this process, when we go from a sentence into this set of units, that's called tokenization. So here, let me just, oops. Uh, Okay, so if we have decided that our units will be uh, words, a uh, set of units is actually called vocabulary. So we will have our vocabulary will be a set of um, words. There's a question of which words you can use any word in English language. I think English dictionary of all words in English has more than 150,000 words, which is way too much for computation we are used in NLP. So you would like to have something smaller, like 30,000 is pretty uh, pretty um, normal. Uh, so you could take some big, big corpus of English language, maybe, uh, I don't know, um, some corpus of English language, and you can count how many times each word occurs, and then you take top 30,000, uh, uh, top 30,000 frequently occurring. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So proper nouns is something we would consider to be uh, very infrequent words or in some cases, unknown words. And um, I'm now using example of using full words, but actually we do not do that. We are using something called subwords. So your proper names would be uh, kind of composed in some of these subwords so you can handle them. Uh, I will come to that next. So bear with me just for a second. Um, Okay, uh, let's say we have a set of uh, words in most frequent, 30,000 most frequent words in English language, then the tokenization uh, would be a process of transforming this sentence S into a list of units, which are words here. So you would have a list of words. It is funny, bright, um, comma, I missed one comma here, and uplifting, period. So this is called tokenization. Um, when you transform your string into a list of these uh, units. Okay, and um, this this uh, a really good question prompted a discussion of what those units actually are. They are not words when in the real use of uh, NLP. So if we go to the collab that's shared in your first assignment, in hope that it didn't break. So, uh, let me see where we are here. Okay, so at some point in your collab, you have some examples. Um, this is not the part of this self here, is not what's in the original collab notebook. This is what I have added. Basically, your object tokenizer has a vocabulary. And here, vocabulary um, has this weird two hashtags and then some combination of characters, their situation. So that's kind of weird, that's not the full word. But these are actual actual units we use uh, in, uh, in NLP. Uh, also, you see if I tokenize this sentence with an actual tokenizer we use in NLP, you will see that the word uplifting has been broken up in up and uh, lifting. Um, this, this happens because we are using an algorithm called 
let me find my Chrome here. It's called uh, BPE or byte pair encoding for tokenization. So basically um, every tokenizer has two components. One is token learner and the other one is token segmenter. And um, in an example of having full words, we can kind of just define full words by taking a dictionary. However, BPE is, a, is an algorithm that learns what are useful units from the data. So you give it a huge corpus of English uh, language, uh, of English uh, text. And it's going to start by finding two characters that are most frequent in this huge collection of text. For example, that could be A and B. And then it's going to uh, add a new merge symbol, AB. So now you have string AB in your set of uh, units. Uh, I will now change from set of units to vocabulary, which is a more technical term for set of units. So uh, once it's merged A and B, we got string AB, it's going to be put into the vocabulary. And it's going to repeat this whole procedure until we have K units, uh, K subwords or tokens. Um, it's going to also respect word boundaries. So very often we give it, instead of just a string of uh, text, we give it a text that's already split into words such that it doesn't merge uh, characters that cross the boundary of two words. So a uh, character that occurs at the end of one word with a character that occurs at the beginning of uh, the other word. So BP will first find the vocab like this. And then once you give it a new, new uh, string, such as it's funny, bright, and uplifting, it's going to do this uh, tokenization for you. The reason why this is super powerful way of tokenizing is, is because we can now handle these unknown words or very infrequent words. And uh, these occur when you have rich morphology. So English is not morphologically super rich language. For example, I speak Croatian, that's my native uh, language. And we have very, um, not, not, I wouldn't say complicated necessarily, but more involved uh, declension of words. We have seven cases. So we add a lot of suffixes to words to kind of communicate what their grammatical role is in a sentence. Now uh, you might, uh, in let's say we had, if we had Croatian corpora, we might, we might have uh, seen the most basic version of a word in a nominative a lot, but we didn't see it in other cases. And if we have uh, subwords uh, uh, kind of handling possible, then we can uh, handle those words that we didn't see very frequently, but we have seen their um, you know, more basic counterpart. So I think this is also case with uplifting. It shows that you have some very frequent prefix together with another word with, which carries uh, some uh, meaning uh, as well. So you kind of handle also these kind of a little bit longer words. And if you know any German, that probably would make you happy uh, because German has a lot of those words that are a combination of uh, other words. Okay, so... Now, we don't need to know everything there is to know about BP. I think if you are interested, you should read uh, uh, this section of this textbook that's linked here. Uh, for me, it's only important that if you play around with any pre-trained language models and you check what is how your text is tokenized, and if you see these two hashtags, you are not terrified. You know that's, oh, that's a subword that's part of whatever previous word has been uh, predicted without hashtags. So here, previous word without any hash hashtags is up. So you know that lifting is part of that uh, actual word. Okay, any questions about this? Great. Okay, um, once we have um, tokenized our, our um, uh, text here we have it's funny bright and blah 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 the same example as before we have uh, split it into subwords uh, now each one of these subwords in its vocabulary it has a corresponding uh, identifier so it's a hash table basically and um, together with our vocabulary which is a hash table we have also something called embedding matrix where each row in this matrix is an embedding of the corresponding subword in a vocabulary. So here, the first uh, first row is the embedding of the whatever is the first word in the vocabulary. 
the embedding of the second, uh, sorry, uh, the second row is an embedding of the second token in the vocabulary and so on. So what we are doing when we are uh, transforming this string into a sequence of integer, the next operation is called so is called lookup, where you find corresponding embeddings of these integers. So you look for the embedding uh, of 101, which is 101, one first, one, oh God, I got so confused. Uh, 100 first uh, row in this embedding matrix. And now uh, from the sequence of integers, you got the sequence of vectors. Okay, is that clear? That's very important. This, this sequence of vectors is going to be input to the transformer. And then transformer is that complicated function of those list of uh, vectors that's going to give us representation of the full sentence. And we will come to that. For now, you just need to uh, be fully on board with that. From string, we got to the list of vectors, high dimensional vectors. They are going to be a um, couple hundred uh, dimensional vectors. Okay, that clear? Okay, um, now you might wonder what to do with uh, images, right? Like you can't really imagine that this exact process could apply to, to images and, and you're right. Uh, we won't use the same procedure we have used for text uh, with images, but one higher level idea is going to be similar and that's that we want to produce the sequence of vectors. That's always input to transformer architecture, a sequence of some vectors. So. Um, Vision Transformer has been introduced only, I believe, two years ago, and the kind of crux of that work was how to transform an image into a sequence of vectors. And uh, what this paper is proposing is that we divide our image into uh, patches of the same size. So as the title of the work says, they use 16 by 16 uh, patches. Here in this image, I don't know what exactly had, uh, then I think we needed 48 by 48 image originally, then, then we had transformed in the sequence of nine 16 by 16 patches. Uh, these patches are still two dimensional, right? Which is not great. We said we need vectors, not matrices as input to our transformer. So once we have these patches, the smaller images, we are going to project each one of them to the same dimensional vector. Um, so that means you are going to have the same uh, uh, matrix size to uh, to uh, to multiply each one of these patch with that matrix to get a vector. And once you have those flattened patches, that's input to your transformer. How do we feel about this? Is it clear? Would it be useful to go over it one, one more time? It's just a lot of unknown, I guess. So <laughs> you are still thinking about it. In any case, I think um, one thing you need to kind of remember with transformers is that you are always producing a linear sequence of vectors. And, and with language, that makes sense because language is sequential. And that's why these things had emerged from language. And then with images, it kind of gets a little bit weird. And then with some other domains, it gets mega weird because you have maybe 3D input uh, and now we are flattening it all out. And for some reason, it works better than architectures that consider the structure very, very carefully. Um, so that's something to have in mind that you will see all kinds of things being linearized. In, in NLP, the first thing that was Kind of like a sin was to linearize trees and that worked really really well and people were really really disappointed that we don't need tree as a structure but uh it it worked really uh really well without it so yeah maybe you will be no this is great it's very simple or you might be sad because you like graphs and now you, everything is is linearized all right you tell yeah, we'll get to position embedding a little bit later on. Uh, so there is also something which is in the input here. I'm keeping it a few slides later just because I want to keep it a little bit simpler for, for now. Yeah, but okay. 
I will try not to say anything about it again. Um, all right, remember um, that it's not only this that goes into transformer, but this is the, the main thing that I want you to remember right now. There is something called positional embeddings and I'll come back to that. Okay, um, so this is how, if we have, uh, these are four images or each one of these like, like little rows is a sequence of 64 patches of size four by four when we transform 32 by 32 image into, into um, a, a sequence of these patches. So each one of these is one image. And if you're like, oh, this seems so confusing and how the model can kind of combine this into anything meaningful, I'm totally on board with you. It's kind of, I don't know, mind blowing that we can represent an image with something as silly as this and, and, it, and it actually works really well. Um, so um, I will share this, I shared it in the slides, but there is this very nice tutorial that's not here for some reason. Um, it's called uh, Tutorial 11 Vision Transformers. It's linked everywhere in the slides. So if you want to try out um, one uh, image classification task, here is uh, the code to do that using Vision Transformer. It really has everything you need similar to, to the notebook for text classification. So if you are thinking about this application, initially I wanted homework to also include training a vision transformer. I realize it's kind of too much, uh, but if you are thinking about um, using something like this, maybe later on, I recommend going over this, uh, this tutorial. Okay, now let's move into, into uh, the actual architecture. So far, we somewhat understand what the input is, not fully, fully, but uh, we have a kind of a sense that at least we are giving some kind of sequence uh, of vectors. Um, the transformer architecture was introduced 27, in 2017. It's kind of actually interesting that's been sticking around for uh, you know uh, about six to seven years now. Other architectures would come and go. Uh, original paper is called Attention is All You Need, and it had resulted in a ton of papers with a similar title. And if you open the original paper, this is the architecture. And uh, if you are mega confused by what are you are looking at here, you are not the only one. Like I still remember when we were reading as PhD students this paper, I was like, oh, I don't this will never be the thing. And I'm like wasting my time looking at this stupid plot and whatnot. I was of course totally wrong. Uh, but uh, I think the authors themselves didn't understand the magnitude of this work. Like if you read the original paper, it reads like the most basic ML NeoRips paper. It doesn't any, have any, you know, like flap for PR around it that we are used to these days when we see uh, big papers coming out. So it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a strange paper to read given the importance it has uh, so far. So instead of kind of focusing on this very convoluted image, we will go over the um, figures that were introduced in this very, very nice blog by Jay Alamar on um, kind of uh, illustrating what goes into a transformer. So first thing to know about the transformer architecture is that it has two big components. One is called encoders and the other one is called decoders. And this is how it was introduced in the original paper. These days we have transformers that have only encoder uh, layers. We have um, transformers that have only decoder layers like your favorite GPT. And we have uh, transformers that still have both like uh, T5, let's say. Um, we'll go over both of them because um, then, then if you know what encoder is and decoder is, then you know all of these variations. Um, so here it looks like one big blob. It's actually stack of, uh, excuse me, stack of encoder and decoder layers. And each one of these blocks uh, here, let's say encoder, is composed of uh, two main components. One is self-attention and the other one is the feedforward neural network. And the, by far the most part, important part of uh, Transformer is a self-attention layer, which itself is composed of 
again, uh, three uh, matrices. Sometimes people put too much emphasis of what these things should be and like what intuition is. I, I think for now, it, you should know that there is something called query matrix and a key matrix. And let's ignore value for now. If you are, let me go over this just a bit slower. So here, our M input X here, I will write it down on, okay. So we have, so you have seen there, X as a matrix, which had uh, two two rows, and then uh, dimension was not written, but it's a D. Um, these two correspond to token one and token two in your sentence that you are given in the input. So it could be something like a cat, for example. So this is what the what the X is referring to, where. Um, these rows are those embeddings that we have mentioned before. So those high dimensional representation of a subword A and subword uh, cat. And then uh, with query and key matrices, uh, we had uh, dimensions uh, uh, surely need to be D and then, um, oh, I don't remember exactly what, so I don't wanna say it. Uh, but it's not important. Uh, in, important is only that the the number of rows matches uh, dimension uh, D. Okay, so we have those matrices that represent our input. It was, I previously said a list of uh, embeddings. We just stack them into a matrix basically. So it's a kind of the same, uh, same thing as I said before. And we are going to multiply each one of these with a query key and value matrix to get query key value for that specific input that we had uh, given to the transformer. Now we will focus on query and key for a moment. We are going to multiply our query with key transpose. Um, I'm focusing on this part here. And important to, uh, to recognize here is that both query and key will have uh, the number of rows to be the number of tokens we had in the input originally. Um, that allows us also to multiply this. Uh, th this comes also from the multiplication of the input with the uh, weight matrices. And the reason why I am uh, emphasizing that is because when you then multiply query with the key transpose, you are going to get a matrix which is of the size uh, input length times input length. So every time we multiply query and key transpose, we are going to get another matrix which is of the size input length times input length. And remember last time when I told you that that allows us to kind of inspect the weights of that matrix to speculate what kind of pairwise relationships between tokens were important for the prediction. This is this is where those matrices uh, come from. Um, another major thing that's super important here is that uh, it is the first architecture where we could uh, start kind of model the relationship of the words that occur in the beginning with, of our sequence with the words that come at the end of the sequence. Before every architecture we had before that kind of lost that information. And I don't wanna go into specifics of that. It's just by the time we came to the end of the sequence, we would forget what happened in the beginning of the sequence. Self-attention and therefore transformers allow to model this, like we call them long dependencies relations between words in a given text. So for the first time you could uh, give maybe a uh, something like a book dissected in certain ways and certain parts would be uh, remembered, although they have been seen way before. So this is a super, super important part of uh, the transformer architecture. Um, other thing that's important here is that it is computationally simple. Previous architecture, and if you are taking NLP with deep learning with Professor Vivek, you will hear about, let's say, recurrent neural networks. And there, um, you would need to 
compute something about the representation of the first word to be able to compute the representation of the next word. Here, you don't need to do that. You have just matrix multiplications, which are way faster than doing something uh, recursively. So due to that, transformers are way faster than the architectures before. And because they are faster, you can give more data because then with more data and the same uh, budget and the same time, you could train, uh, basically you could train with uh, more data. Sorry, this was very convoluted. What I wanted to say, if you have the same budget with transformers and some other architecture, you are comparing what you can train on with transformers, you can train with more data given the same time and hardware. And that was the one big thing that has happened with the transformer together with this modeling of long range dependencies in your input, which come from self attention. Okay, um, I will stop at some point uh, to ask whether you have questions. I just wanna go over the whole encoder stack uh, before that. So what we have seen here um, is uh, this query here, query and key matrices, which the product of these will eventually be multiplied with the value matrix. And that's kind of like a new representation of our input. Um, however, we don't have only one set of query key and value matrices. We have multiple of those. And then multiple of those will result with multiple self-attention, uh, what we call heads. So we don't have just one of these uh, multiplications here. We will repeat this process in parallel multiple times. Um, and that's why this attention um, mechanism is called multi-headed self-attention. Each one of these repeating of these, it's called a head. Um, you might wonder like, why are we doing that? And that's just to kind of increase the computational power of this whole thing. So with the different heads, you are kind of hoping that your model will learn to do different things. So one head might be learning about subject word uh, relation in the, uh, in the sentence. Other head might learn about verb object relations. And the third one might be capturing whether negation was present or not. We don't know whether any of those things are actually being done. We can just, after we have trained the model, analyze and look at a bunch of these to kind of speculate whether indeed this had happened. But um, there is some evidence that shows that these heads are specializing for different things. However, there is also evidence that a lot of them are learning the same things. So there is a lot of redundancy uh, in these heads and that's why the whole, um, line of work on making transformers more efficient is, is a thing where it is recognized that we are kind of wasting some of these matrices to learn a thing we have already learned before. So why not kind of force them to learn, to have one head or one skill basically. Uh, but that's the idea behind having uh, multiple attention heads. Now, when you multiply your, um, uh, so this thing will be the size of your input times size of your input. So um, in, in the end, you will have size of your input, input length times D uh, as the output. And you will have multiple of those. Here are those outputs of, um, of self-attention times uh, value matrix is called Z. And you are going to just concatenate all of those in one gigantic sequence. So before we had each one of these was uh, some small D, now we have D times attention head as the vector for the each one of the uh, words in our input. Okay, so that's very usually like huge and we want to now decrease it again. Uh, it's kind of the standard way of, I think, how machine learning people deal with architecture building. They're like, ah, no, and produce something huge. Let's now make it smaller. And you're kind of just repeating that whole process. So that's why this 44 ne neural network layers come after the self-attention, just to kind of decrease the size after we have uh, increased this. And this kind of puts everything together. Um, so we start with our input. Input is 
a sequence of subwords, right? Each one of the subwords is represented with an embedding. And uh, we, instead of having a list of embeddings, which is not a great, um, you know, abstraction for computation, for a numerical computation, we will, are going to stack them into a matrix. So this is embedding of the first subword. This is the embedding of the second subword. Therefore, we have a matrix of size two because we had two subwords times the dimension of the initial embedding. Um, then we are going to decide how many heads we are going to have in our pre-trained language model. And for each one of these heads, we are going to have a set of three matrices query, key, and value. Then for each one of these heads, we are going to multiply these weight matrices with our input to get query key value for that specific uh, uh, input. We are going to then multiply query and key, which will give us the matrix of size of the input length times size of the input length. We are going to multiply that one with the value matrix. And again, we are going to get the matrix that's of the same size as the initial one. Um, not excuse me, I said something that's wrong. N not same size completely. We will have the same number of rows because we had two words. We are still going to work, have number of rows be equal to the number of subwords we had in the beginning, but the dimension can be something different. It depends. It's a hyperparameter you, you set. You can set it to be equal to what we had initially or not. And then uh, we will have as many of these matrices as we had uh, attention uh, heads. And we are going to combine them in a one huge thin matrix uh, by concatenating row-wise. And we are going to multiply that one with uh, another weight matrix to get our final representation. This whole thing represents what happens in one encoder block with some additional details. OK, now, do you have questions about this whole, whole thing? It's a little bit complicated at the first, if you see it for the first time, it gets more and more you see it, you're like, okay, I get it. But at least you understand why I was frustrated the first time we, we were reading this paper. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it is a hyperparameter that someone has to set. And um, it's not hard to say retrospectively why people have chosen certain numbers at that time. I would say they were capped by how much computational power they had. You had certain amount of GPUs that were have, have certain you know specifics at the time. Most important one being GPU memory. And the more the larger your dimension of your of your uh, embedding is, the more the bigger your matrices become, and therefore you might not be able to fit them on the hardware you have, or training them would take way longer than uh, than you you have GPUs for. So a lot of these things are just set by what was the specifics at the time, um, but more or less uh, at every phase, larger has been better. Um, now, there isn't like super strong, I would say, maybe necessarily empirical evidence for that, but there is a whole theory on something called infinitely wide neural networks. So here, that would, would be determined by, you know, when we concatenated all these, um, all these attention head, outputs of attention head, we got that gigantic vector. And that's in a way, connection to that work about infinitely, infinitely wide. So there is some kind of theoretical hint that that, you know, that the wider these things become, the better the performance could be. Uh, but training such, ne such neural networks has never really worked out. So it's kind of, yeah, kind of a loose connection, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, of course, him. Uh, yeah, so basically this is kind of intuition of query and value. Query is uh, uh, kind of uh, remembering uh, both query and uh, key matrices should remember what the inputs are or kind of represent inputs. So when you make uh, their uh, outer product, uh, sorry, normal product of these two matrices, you get um, kind of like um, 
try to imagine if you were doing out a product of two vectors in a way to, to get the relationship of each one of these things in their dimensions. I, I don't know. I never liked this kind of uh, putting too much meaning to these things. It's kind of came from that. Um, uh, to me, these are just it. I, I literally think them about them about them the exactly what they are. They are just matrices, and they give me a matrix of the size input input that to some extent models the relationship between these two things. And now, when you have importances between two, each one of the words, you need value which represents input again to kind of uh, use importances between words to combine them into something that's, you know, again, one thing. Um, but I don't know. Um, yeah, if you read this blog post, they will put way more emphasis in which what each one of these things might might be, if you want to kind of prescribe to that. that yeah. Oh, sorry, I don't hear you. Can you speak on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, all of these that are denoted with W are trainable. So uh, this, this set here, and then the last one. But, you know, you make a product of a weight matrix with whatever is current representation to get some output. That output is just an output. It's not trainable. Yeah. So the value matrix is not available. Um, sorry, I think I, I used the terminology which was a little bit overloaded. So there are uh, query key value weight matrices, and there is query key value. Query key value weight matrices multiplied with your current representation gives you care query key value. That's a little bit confusing because the, the terminology sounds a little bit the same, but these are query key value weight matrices, and these are just query key value matrices. So for query, you'll have a different value for each value. Yeah, for every, like they are input dependent. Yeah. 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 So again, like the kind of the one way to in, maybe intuitively think about this is. Query um, is a current representation of every input uh, token. Key is also a representation of every single input in the token. I am doing their product to find the relationship between these words. So how important one word was for the other. And once you have learned those importances, when you multiply those importances with value, every word becomes a weighted combination of a representation of other words in the input, where those weights are those importance scores. So I think that's it. That's all you need to kind of know about this three set of matrices. All right. Um, so if you if you like things right written in a math way, there it is. I don't want to go over this. It's in a way, this is how I think. So for me, it's always helpful to see this written in exact computations. Um, all right, and as I said, what we have seen so far is the output of one encoder block. So after we have done that final uh, product with the uh, weight, final weight matrix, we get a new representation of the input. And now remember, we have started with some embeddings. Now we are doing everything we have done with the encoder block one except that the input is that whatever is the current representation of every input word or token. Um, okay, uh, let me just skip. Okay, I don't wanna skip. Um, so yeah, you're basically having these encoder blocks, you get the output and then that output goes into the, to be the input of the next block and so on and so on and so on and that's, that's the entire encoder encoder stack. Um, I did say at some point, like we have few details that I, uh, I I skipped. One of them is something called a layer norm. 
where you are going to take your original, whatever was the original representation of the input, are going to sum it with whatever is the representation, uh, current representation of the input and uh, make the kind of normalization that all the values uh, in the, in the uh, whatever is the representation that we get are around the mean um, of, of, uh, of the values. Um, when, when you ask about the uh, dimensions, there is only one trick that has been used here. And that's that in the end, we, we end up with the same dimension that we had in the input. Otherwise we would not be able to sum the original one with the, uh, with the current one. Um, and that means that when you decide whatever is the number of heads, you're going to take uh, the original dimension divided by number of heads, and that's going to be one of the dimension in uh, query key value weight matrices. So, so there are little tricks like that that you need to take care of, but um, they don't have any other meaning than being able to sum these two matrices uh, in the end. Uh, previously, this has been known as a residual connection. When you kind of bring your matrix from the beginning back to the back to the uh, deeper layer of your neural network architecture. So yeah, residual connection and layer normalization are two little things that are also here. They are super crucial though. If you place the layer normalization at a different part of the uh, of this encoder stack, things won't work as good as they would if you place them at the right place. So um, they seem like detail, but they are also very crucial. Another detail that I skip is this uh, this uh, denominator here. This was introduced for, if you read the original paper, for stability reasons. And um, they don't say much more. I think they were just trying out things and they realized that they are getting maybe too huge gradients and they realized, okay, maybe they cap them in this way that uh, things will become more stable. So it's, I think, something they found in Berkeley. Okay, um, one, one thing that um, we mentioned uh, in the past and before were positional embedding. So um, if, if we don't have these, if currently everything I said didn't include information about how these things come in, uh, in order in the, uh, in the sentence. Uh, in the end, these are just vectors. We put them in a matrix and then we kind of do a product of these vectors and then we combine them. But information of which word came before which one is lost in this process. And that's why we need to introduce these positional embeddings. Uh, these are just another vector uh, kind of associated with numbers one, two, three, four, meaning first, second, third, fourth, or fifth word in the input. Um, each one of them is again high dimensional and it's high dimensional because then we can sum them with the uh, embeddings uh, that correspond to the meaning of the word uh, initially. And now when the, this, when we, when we sum these two vectors, your um, resulting vector contains information about semantics of the words, but also uh, about the position of the word uh, in the input. How to, how to compute these embeddings has always been um, kind of dynamic. Um, initially, they were using some sine and cosine formulas, then they moved them into just being learnable embeddings, uh, just like any other embeddings. Um, now they moved into something else. So it's kind of dynamic, uh, an active area of research of which kind of positional embeddings we should put here. And um, the latest pre-trained language models, if you, if you read the specifics, the transformers has been changed minimally. Maybe they change where they put the layer normalization, uh, but the uh, two new things that have been introduced are positional embeddings that came from a research paper that's only like a year old, and um, activation functions we use are also more recent. So these two things have uh, changed in the latest pre-trained language models. Okay, and finally, this was all about the encoder. Then there is a decoder step. Um, decoder steps are basically the same as encoder step, except that self-attention uh, will go 
over tokens that we generate. So here, maybe we had the task of machine translation. We had sentences in one language. I think this is, I don't know, with French, maybe French, okay. Um, in, from French to English. And this means that on the, on the output side, we need to decode word by word. And this is what the decoder does. Decoder is basically kind of the same thing as, a, as a, an encoder. At the end, your uh, weight matrix is not that, uh, you know, two dimensional, uh, as I had when I was writing down binary classification task. Let me go back to that. So here, when we had binary classification task, the number of columns we had in our weight matrix was two. And uh, when we are predicting a word, the number of columns here will be the size of our vocabulary, which is about 30,000. But the procedure is exactly the same. You are just multiplying uh, your current representation at that decoding step with the matrix of the size D times the size of the vocab. You are going to get the vector of the size of the vocabulary. You are fine, gonna find where is the max position, and that's going to be the word you are going to predict. The only thing that kind of then gets um, different, I would say, is that with classification you are done, right? And you know you have the class for your whole sequence. With the decoding, uh, you have uh, you are using that word to generate the next one. So you will have something like beginning of sequence token. It goes into the decoder stack, which has exact same mechanism as encoder stack. You are going to predict the word, let's say it, and then this word goes as, as an input here. And then you have your decoder uh, stack and so on. So that's a difference. Like you need to decode uh, this word. With a little kind of tweak during training because decoding actual word is slow. So instead we do something called teacher forcing and here we put whatever was actually in the original uh, data. Um, and all of this is not super important. At some point we will go into more details of it. I'm going over this just to emphasize that then the self-attention layer we have in our decoder layers are not going to attend only to input words, but also input words and the words we have decoded so far. So basically our input is becoming uh, larger and uh, and we, we are going to attend to those extra words that we have uh, decoded, which requires some you know, implementation uh, tricks because you don't want to, you want to fix your matrices immediately. So you don't want to increase the size of your self-attention and query and key and value matrices. So you basically set what you think will be the largest possible sequence you will decode. And then to enforce that the model doesn't see the next words, you are going to replace the values uh, of, uh, of self-attention, uh, excuse me, values in the self-attention matrix with infinite, and then it will be, become zero later on. So these are some technical details that, you know, uh, I get it that it's now getting a little bit complicated and probably overwhelming, um, but try to remember that the thing that changes is encoder, uh, decoder attention, and try to remember that we are preventing decoder stacks from seeing future tokens by putting uh, infinite values at the corresponding uh, um, places in the self-attention uh, layers. Okay, and this is basically illustration of predicting the word. All right, this is all you need to know, I think, for this course about uh, transformer as an architecture. And I wanna talk more about how we go about retraining. Um, but let's, yeah, maybe stop uh, here uh, and see whether there are any questions about this. Yeah, so maybe not directly, directly mm -hmm. related, but um, I'm kind of curious if you know like how the large language models were. So is it basically just you and the only encoders mm -hmm. transformer? Like you would 
theme and codings of whatever your thing is. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, when we talk about pre-trained language models, it's important to know that there are they come in different flavors. So what you describe now, we call those decoder only uh, pre-trained language models where uh, we are going to pre-train them with what we call language modeling objective, which is train one word at a time. But those are not the only ones. And actually that comes kind of next. So maybe we can start uh, talking about this a little bit. So um, let me skip a bunch of things and go into uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, here. So if we have only decoder stack and we take our data and uh, we predict next word at the time, that kind of objective is called uh, language modeling. And this is these are GPT models. But then there are a bunch of others, such as BERT, which was the first pre-trained language model, uh, which is uh, taking only encoder uh, encoder stack, and that is the classification on top of uh, the encoder stack. Um, Bird-like models are good for classification. GPT kinds of models are good for generation, which kind of is not surprising given this, that now that what we know about encoder and decoders. But then there are architecture which are encoder decoder. And today, whenever you see large language models, most likely it's going to be decoder, decoder only transformer. Somehow everything has turned into this, what's now branded as generative AI, which is just what we have known as, you know, language modeling and predicting next word. Now it has extra flavor, extra things um, on top of just language modeling. So it's not just a language model anymore. So yeah, when you read large language model these days, most likely it's going to be a decoder only transformer, which is pre-trained with the language modeling objective. But do not think that all large language models are decoder only transformers pre-trained with, uh, uh, with uh, language modeling. They can be pre-trained with something else. We'll talk about that next time. They can be not decoder only. They can have be only a coder only and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a lot. <laughs> Um, let me see, is there anything else I can talk about now? Yeah, I think uh, maybe the transformer is, um, it's always brain melting to, to learn about it the first time. So uh, I think it's better that we do not now go into the pre-trained stuff and next time we can start with, uh, okay, now we have uh, our transformer. How do we take a huge collection of text or huge collection of images and use that to change those weights in the transformers, weights being weights of query, key, value, matrices, and feed forward layers to then be able to do just a little bit of supervision on top of that pre-trained model and get really good results. Okay, um, reminder, tomorrow at one are those Zoom office hours for trying out instructions. And I'll try to figure out with CHPC folks uh, to get you all right access. Okay.